Welcome back everyone to Moto Bob Vlogs. I'm out today with Chris, whose channel is called Farmer Talk. And uh, if you're a Triumph fan, a Bonneville fan, then you might have already seen it because he's got a 1200 XE that he's riding today. And I think he started his channel with a speed twin as well that he modded a bit. Uh, so you may have seen his videos, but if not, I'll link to the channel in the description and you can go and check it out. I'm on the BMW Urban GS. 40th anniversary edition, borrowing it for a couple of weeks from BM, and I've been super excited about this one because I absolutely loved the R9T last year. It's quite punchy, considering it's an air-cooled twin, and I really wanted to try it in this sort of uh, jacked up, well, slightly jacked up package. And of course, a 40th anniversary paint job looks absolutely incredible. So yeah, this is going to be a great day. We're actually filming a uh, comparison video with the 1200 Scrambler because they are similar in many respects and then quite different in others. Uh, so we've just been at his farm down by the river shooting an intro and a kind of review of the specs of the two bikes. Now we're going to get on the road and ride for a bit, swap bikes, and then I think we're going to stop in Lynmouth for a bit of lunch, fish and chips and uh, probably wrap up our thoughts there. It's just like a first impressions, how do they compare on the road? So I'll be riding this bike for the first half of this video, getting all the riding footage that I need for my main channel. Uh, but this will be a more extensive ride around the back lanes of North Devon. And then I'll swap over onto the XE. And I'm fairly familiar with that bike. I've borrowed one for a while and uh, had them from dealers as courtesy bikes, I think actually. So plenty of miles in on it, absolutely love it. I mean, the thing with that bike is that uh, everybody said when they did the first rides of it and it was launched that, wow, it can perform off-road. And I think Triumph held that launch in Portugal and put on a little dirt track and uh, the traveling, the suspension and the off-road electronics that uh, really minimize intervention, that 21 inch front wheel, all combined for something that does actually go pretty well off-road considering it's a, a retro scrambler anyway it's not going to be your first choice for green laning and even Chris will say that he would never choose to take a 220 kilogram bike off-road um, but it can do it and it's specced around that capability as well as uh, on-road in fact in the video this morning I was saying it's more like a, a modern adventure bike it's got great components um, really advanced electronics for this genre but yeah in a retro aesthetic and with that Bonneville twin that of course is designed to feel like a, a motor from yesteryear although it is liquid cooled and all that this Urban GS you've really got to remember that they've called it the Urban GS and they haven't really tried I don't think to make it into a proper scrambler type bike. I mean, the Boxer Twin, if you dropped it, that's not gonna be great, is it? And also there's not really any protection under the engine. Uh, the head has run down there as well. So it would be hard to make this a very robust off-road scrambler retro type bike. Whereas that bike has a, a decent belly pan and some crash bars that would give it some protection at least. And so I think, yeah, they haven't really tried to go too far down that route with this one. It, uh, it does sit taller than the standard R90. It's 850 mil in the seat height. And uh, it does feel tall. It does feel scramblery. It's got the wide bars on it and they're a little taller than the R90s as well. Uh, but ultimately you've still only got 125 mil of travel at the front, 140 at the rear. It's not adjustable apart from preload and rebound on the shock. So uh, it's going to be limited in many respects. And what you're probably looking at with it is gravel roads and that kind of thing and light off-roading. And it'll still be plenty of fun for that. And really it captures the spirit of the original R80GS that they've kind of based it on or the R100GS. You know, that was a road bike with a few adaptations for trails but it didn't necessarily have the latest and greatest of uh, off-road equipment on it and what you end up with with this bike is something that's really oh, look at this this is beautiful this is what i wanted to do more of on this channel just show you some of these roads this is up from the farm 
Uh, I have no idea where we are, but maybe I can look it up later. Heading towards the north coast of Devon anyway. Oh my gosh, this is beautiful. Uh, yeah, what you end up with with the Urban GS is a slightly scrambler position, a cool looking bike, it has to be said. Uh, but it is really a bit more road focused than the Triumph and probably more road focused even than the XC model of the Triumph. But BMW have been upfront about that with the branding and the naming. They said it's an Urban GS. And actually, what a road bike it is. It makes 109 horsepower, which is plenty for this genre. It's one of the most powerful retros it has to be. Probably the Z900 RS or something like that. But otherwise, this is really punchy. And it surprises you at the top end just how well it'll go. And then you combine that with good quality suspension that's not necessarily the best of the best or uh, offering much personalization, but it's good. It handles nicely. It's a cushy ride, I would say, but, um, you know, it's enough for lanes like this and B roads and stuff. And then the brakes are decent as well. Again, not top spec like the M50 calipers from Brembo and the Brembo radial master cylinder on the Scrambler, uh, but it's all good stuff. I mean, it'll stop you easily quick enough for this kind of riding and beyond. But what I really love about this bike on the road is the character of it. I know that's a cliche, but ride one of these R9Ts and tell me that it doesn't feel unique and very BMW-y. -y. It really is. Uh, from the, again, a cliche, firing it up and it rocking side to side. And then you've got that smooth drone from the even firing intervals that uh, give it that nice exhaust note. I think so anyway, through the Akropovic uh, cans that the high level cans that come as standard on this 40 years version. There's a single plate dry clutch as well and a shaft drive, which all makes it feel very direct to me. There's no slipper clutch like the Triumph. You get a cush drive, don't you, with chain driven bikes, which offers a little bit of forgiveness. This feels really direct and actually you're best on this bike being quite precise with the rev matching when you're shifted down coming into corners. Oh, this is beautiful. Opened up a bit here so you can go that a little bit quicker and flow through these turns. But yeah, as you break into a corner, it really does pay to be accurate with your rev matching on this bike. And um, it's super satisfying to ride. I said that with the, the R9T, the more sporty spec than this. Same on the way up as well, I think, uh, up through the gears as you accelerate. If you're too quick with the throttle, it'll buck a little bit. And it does make for a bike that is, like I say, unlike anything else to ride, certainly on the retro market. thing that's nice about this engine is it's just really linear there's no big mid-range that dies off at the top and equally it has plenty of torque down low so uh, you've got a really usable engine and it does continue to climb and give you a bit of top end that might be lacking on uh, I don't think the 1200 scrambler is too bad but certainly my street twin for example that's a, a much less powerful retro but it delivers good torque down at 3,000 revs and at the top end it really dies off. This doesn't feel like that. It has plenty to go at at all revs really. Now I believe this might be called the Valley Road or the River Road, something like that. And uh, it runs in the bottom of the valley and Chris was saying it's a, a local's favorite because it twists quite nicely following the river. Although he said you can get stuck behind traffic quite easily um, because the visibility is not necessarily perfect. Uh, that can mean that it takes a while to get past people. Okay, well maybe that wasn't the uh, valley slash river road. 
because we've just come off it. Uh, but we're making our way up to Lynmouth, like I say, famous spot for fish and chips, which I might be sampling, especially if there's some curry sauce going. Appreciate all the comments on the last video I posted. Uh, a few people were interested in the setup that I'm using for moto vlogging, which has changed a little bit recently. I've changed my helmet. I've changed the, the cameras over a few months ago. Uh, so, I'll definitely post a bit of an update on that at some point, but the tips for getting good audio on the bike are exhaustive, or at least there's quite a few steps in my process that I think are important, so I'll save it for another day when I don't perhaps have two great bikes to ride and some incredible scenery and beautiful roads. Let's focus on that today. Wow. Look at that. It's only five, six months, maybe less since we moved out of London uh, over towards the West Country. And this is exactly why going full time on YouTube, I want scenery and quiet roads and good places to ride. I mean, where, where better to ride a couple of retro scramblery type bikes than roads like this and scenery like, you know, what we're seeing here. Are they alpacas, I believe? There we go. Maybe llamas. I don't really know the difference. If anyone does, let me know. I'm sure Chris does. I'll ask him when we stop. But I'm pretty sure you don't get llamas so much here, but you do get the odd alpaca farm. It looks a bit murky over towards the coast. I hope we don't get a soak in today because uh, it is an hour back down the motorway to get home and I haven't bought any wet. So I always say I'm a proper optimist when it comes to weather. I always assume that if the forecast is 50-50, it will go in my favor. And as a result, most of the time I end up getting soaked. And today could be a continuation of that pattern. So let's hope not. This has got to be the river road, hasn't it? The river's down there anyway. <laughs> and I don't think anyone came past us for a while, so hopefully we get a clean run. Now, although I said this is linear in the way it sort of delivers power, this bike, it does pay to keep it a bit higher in the rev range. So peak torque's at 4,000 on that bike and six on this even though they both make their peak power at the same revs of 7250. But there's no rev counter on the Urban GS, just a single speedo. And I don't think you can even get it uh, if you scroll through the LCD. So uh, it's only the range topping R90 that gets uh, twin clocks. And although you do get an Akropovich high level exhaust on this version, it's not that loud. It's still like homologated. and finding the right revs sometimes, especially when you get up to 60 and if you've got earplugs in, it's not super loud and audible. So you're kind of going off the vibes of it. Chris's bike has a Street Scrambler 900 exhaust on it, the Vance and Heinz ugh, high level with the carbon finisher on it. And I think he did that because that bike has a reputation for getting really hot, the exhaust against your leg. And there was a big cat there that probably slowed down the airflow. And I think his thinking was if he shortened it and put a straight through little Vance and Hines on it, then it would get the heat away quicker, stop your leg getting toasted. And although it has been somewhat successful, he says it still does get quite warm. So uh, I'll be interested to try that out. But one thing is it sounds absolutely lovely. Very short, looks cool. The Vance and Hines looks good anyway, without shortening the headers, um, but it really does sound good. We did a sound check earlier. I'll post that on the main channel. And it's not really a fair comparison because that's a custom bit of work where he had it modded himself. Uh, but it does sound lovely. In fact, I can't wait to ride it and see what it's like when you're actually on the bike. The other thing is no, oh, another pheasant or something. You paired two pheasants there. Um, the other thing is no gear position indicator on this bike, no uh, fuel gauge, no nothing, super simple. And I'd love to hear what you think of that in the comments. Is that something you reckon would actually be quite fun and plays into the retro vibe or 
uh, is it just too impractical? I don't find it too bad. I can keep an eye on the mileage, use the trip counter, and there is a fuel warning light, but some people just might find it irritating. I think as a practical bike, if you're commuting, it's quite annoying those days where you just need to get to work and then the fuel light comes on and you're thinking, oh God, I could do without stopping now. I used to have that with my old Kawasaki ER6N that didn't have a fuel gauge either. You know, that said, it does have some advanced electronics on it. So uh, lean sensitive ABS is now standard across the R9T range for 2021. Dynamic brake control kills the throttle when you're emergency braking so uh, that you're not accidentally plowing on a bit and increasing your stopping distance. So uh, assuming that I'd probably rather have than not if I had the choice. It's got cruise control, heated grips on this version. What else? I mean, it does have TC. Oh, it's got three riding modes. So road and rain are standard and you probably can guess what rain mode does. It gives you a easy going throttle map and keener, twitchier TC and ABS, I guess. And then it also has a dirt mode, which delays them. So they don't kick in quite as early, it gives you a bit more uh, room to play with the slide and slip before it saves you. So that sounds quite fun, but I don't think we'll really be doing any off-roading today, uh, just because I just really wouldn't want to drop this one and it doesn't really have anything to save it. And then I'll be borrowing Chris's bike for part of this ride. And again, like that would be a worst case scenario, wouldn't it? Trying to do something impressive off-road beyond my skill level and end up dropping his pride and joy because it's really nicely done, some really tasteful mods on it. Uh, as I've already said as well, some custom work. And so it'd be a real shame to wreck it. The other thing on days like this as well is like the rucksack that I'm wearing right now is like a big camera bag. I've got a decent size of camera, four lenses, loads of batteries and filters in case I need them. Uh, the GoPros are normally in there, some mics, an audio recorder, uh, a tripod with a, you know, like a video head on it and then a big slider to get those cinematic shots. And it all adds up to something pretty cumbersome and makes you feel weighted down and quite top heavy. And so when you're doing kind of quicker riding like this, it does limit your movement a bit and certainly off-road if you want to stand up. It does make it tricky. Like I say, this bike isn't really made for it anyway. And uh, you can tell that from the standing position. It just doesn't really have a standing position. You're stooping down quite low to get to the bars. It doesn't feel comfortable for riding for more than, you know, 30 seconds a minute. Whereas the Scrambler, you can easily stand up on it. Anyway, let's swap. Oh, quite a bit louder. That'll be nice for you guys though, because you'll probably get enough um, exhaust note in the mic in my helmet for it actually to sound good. The riding position is surprisingly different on this bike. Looking at them, you know, the GS does look that, that bit lower, and it certainly is, uh, but you feel sat up and sat in this bike a little bit, whereas uh, the R90, you're more over it, over the front, and the bars are much higher on this bike. So like I say, you can stand up, no problems, uh, and it feels super comfy. Love that Chris keeps his keyless ignition key in the steering lock. I mean, I think I'll probably do the same as well, just to save uh, rustling around in my pockets for it or worrying that I'd uh, left it somewhere or set off without it. Now, Chris said he's got all the suspension like pretty backed off so that it's quite soft because uh, obviously you've got a lot of rough road surfaces around here. So it does feel very cushy and comfy. And I think I would do the same for the majority of my riding. And then combined with that 21 inch front, I would say it doesn't have the same directness in the front end as the R9T. But I just love these Bonneville engines, especially with a good exhaust. What a 
a great sounding bike. Have you seen how much roadkill there is here? I've probably seen about 10 dead pheasants, but they will wander in the road, won't they? They're asking for it all the time. The brakes do feel a little more direct on this bike as well. As you'd expect with, I think you've got braided lines. I'm not sure if they are on the R90, um, but monoblock calipers on this as well, like sports bike almost, uh, the M50s, and then the radial master cylinder. It all just feels, although it's not snatchy and harsh, because uh, you wouldn't want that if you are going to do gravel and stuff. Uh, it just feels very, like I say, tight and precise. The exact amount of pressure that's going into that lever is what you feel like you're getting back from the brakes. I mean, the nice thing for me about riding any of the Bonnevilles, Speed Twin, uh, Ferxton, T100, T120, even the Bobbers and Speedmasters, is like the gearbox always has a roughly similar feel and it's quite familiar to me. I've done so many rides on them through YouTube stuff, but also my own Street Twin, that it's just second nature uh, when I jump on it. There's no, uh, you know, 10 minutes of getting acquainted with it. It's just a, um, an instinct. But I mean, beyond the engine and suspension being much taller on this bike and uh, better spec braking, the, the big difference is the tech. It does look slightly retro with that analog layout that you can select on this uh, round TFT. But underneath it all, all that connectivity on the phone and uh, the six axis IMU and lean sensitive TC and ABS. And what else have we got? Cruise control like that bike, but five riding modes on this one. So the Offroad Pro lets you switch more stuff off. This is comprehensive. It's night and day really. And I think it's intentional on both counts. If you want a techie BMW, there's all the adventure range, the 1250 GS, which sells so well. Uh, the F850, even the F750 has got, if you spec it with the TFT anyway, has got a lot of tech. And I think they've assumed that if you're gonna buy the Urban GS or the R90, then you probably don't want one of their techie roadsters or adventure bikes. You want something simplistic and that's what they've done with it. And it, it definitely does that. Uh, with this bike, I suppose, try and have the Street Scrambler, which does that old school, easy going, retro flavor better than this bike, because everything is a bit lower spec and less powerful and less techy. It feels like an older Scrambler. And so why not just go for that kind of really capable well-featured adventure bike in a retro package. I think it's just such a cool combo of spec and aesthetics and uh, the way it feels to ride, you know? Oh, we're stopping here. Oh, here we go. Now that is a nice view. Anyway, I think I'll wrap this one up here. Thanks for joining me for this little ride. And I think uh, if we do have fish and chips, I'll post a picture. And I was, hmm, um, but this is a, con you sort of think they're similar, but, but then you ride them and they're talking to you. Yeah, totally. In a nice way. Yeah, yeah. Um, what did you 